So I want to understand motion. And I want to understand how exactly is motion different from rest. To do this, I want to observe the world. I want to go outside and try it. So if I go outside, the first question I have in my mind is, how do I know something is moving and something is not? So I look out there and it seems like this. If I focus on an object and if I don't have to turn my head, it's just there, then I seem to say, that's at rest. Then if I have to turn my head to keep going along with the object, then I seem to say it's moving. That seems to be how I decide these two things. Now the first question that comes to my mind then is, if something is moving, how far is it going? If I know that, can I just close my eyes for a while, then come back and say, now I have to look exactly there and that's where the body will be. That will help me predict where it's going. So the first question, how far? And I know that the answer for this will be something like a number, a length, right? That's what I learned in my first chapter. When you ask the question, how far? You get a length as your answer. Can I represent this length only with how far I turn my head? Is that enough? Ha! Huh. So just knowing how much I turn my head is not enough. Because a bird flying somewhere close by at 50 kilometers per hour, an aeroplane flying very, very fast, let's say 500 kilometers per hour, very far away, are both going to require the same amount of head turning. Oh, I didn't think of that one. So if an object is going straight away from me, then I don't have to turn my head to keep looking at it, but still it's moving, right? And to me, how will it look like? It'll look like it's getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And I wouldn't know whether it's actually getting smaller or it's going far away. That's just, I'm just going to have to stick to my experience. So what I'm understanding here is, it's not enough to understand whether I'm turning my head or looking around. That's not a good measure of how far something is moving, a good measure of motion. So what do I use? Is there a better way to measure motion? What if I look at a body that's moving and measure the actual path length that it takes? If I can give it a string, watch what happens to that string and then stretch it out and measure that length. Now, would that be a useful quantity? Because if it's not useful, directly or indirectly, then what's the point of measuring it? But wait, it seems like there can be some interesting uses to that particular quantity. Wow! So things like how long a journey might take, how much fuel to put into the car, even the wear and tear on the vehicle depend upon this thing called the path length. So if it's this important, it probably has a name, right? Its name is the distance. So when I'm measuring the distance, I start from where the object begins, just measure the length of the path that it takes, and I get a number as my answer. Now in this, I don't care about where the body starts, where it ends, I only care about the length of the path. But are there cases where I want to know where it started and where it ended? Wow, this is crazy. To know how much fuel to put, I need to know the exact path length. But if I have to also know how much to reset my watch, then the path length just won't be enough. I also need to know which city I started from and which city I'm ending in. That's what's going to give me that information. Even though, now that I think of it, the path length is not even required, right? I start from a city, end in a different city. What path I take to go from city A to city B does not matter. So here I have a case where the path length does not matter, but where I begin and where I end matters. So then I could do something, right? I could just represent the entire world, just like I do on a graph sheet with X and Y. Yeah, so give every, every city in the world an X coordinate and a Y coordinate, and then give the other city an X and Y. Then all I have to report is the position of this and the position of that in the right order though, because it will matter whether I'm going east or west. And that's it, I'm done. Isn't that crazy? I feel like a genius. What? They already do that? What's it called? The latitude and the longitude. Oh, human beings are smart. So we already have a way to represent cities as coordinates. One is called the latitude and the other is called the longitude. So then my, my solution is correct, right? All I have to do is give the latitude and longitude of a city, latitude and longitude of the destination city, the starting and the destination, and I'm done. If I think about it now though, do I even need to give these two? Both these latitudes and longitudes, is it required? Wow, so this means I don't even have to know the starting city and the ending city. All I need is the amount of longitudes that I pass to go from one to the other. So this means in a more general case, if I have a starting point and an ending point, all I have to do is draw a straight arrow between the two of them. And that's enough. So as long as I don't change the direction of this arrow and the length of this arrow, I'm good. No matter where I take and keep this arrow, it will keep giving me the answer to the question. In the first case, how much should I reset my watch? And in various other cases, various answers. So what have I identified here? When I care about how I travel, I need my distance. But when I don't care about how I travel, when I care about the starting and the ending point alone, this arrow is enough. Oh, so this arrow seems really interesting and useful as well. So it must have a name. The name of this arrow is displacement. 
Now, our excursion into these ideas of motion just by asking how do I know something is moving has led us to two quantities, distance and displacement. Now, I want to see what must be true if whatever I've assumed about distance and displacement are true. If these two are true, what else must be true? Great. So now that I know the definitions of distance and displacement, I'm asking myself, keeping these as building blocks, what more can I infer? So when I think about it, the first and most obvious thing that's striking me is that distance is just a number, it's a length. This means that I can do whatever I want with it, right? Add, subtract, multiply, anything that I've done with numbers, I can do with my distance. Is there anything else that I can infer about distance? Can it be any number? Oh, so if the distance is the path length, then even if I don't even start my journey, my path is going to be zero. So it can never ever go below zero, right? If I start, it becomes greater than zero. And it's going to, oh wait, this also means that if I keep, if I start my journey, at, even if I retrace my path, the distance is going to keep increasing only because the path is going to keep increasing. So the moment my journey begins, there is no point where the distance of the path is going to become lesser than its previous value. In other words, the distance is a monotonically increasing function. So my next question is, are distance and displacement connected? But, but the moment I think about that, I, I think distance is a number and displacement is an arrow. What kind of a connection can I draw between a number and an arrow? Okay, fine. I'll start using better words from now on. A number, a quantity that's only a number is called a scalar. But an arrow cannot be represented just with a number, right? It needs more than one number because an arrow has both a length and a direction. So if I represent the length of this arrow as its magnitude, a length, and if I represent the direction as the angle it makes with the x-axis, then I'm done. Then I have the magnitude and the direction as a length and an angle respectively. So then, even though I cannot compare distance and displacement, I can compare distance and the magnitude of displacement because both of them are lengths. I think it'll be better if I visualize this. So if I take two points, then, and if I travel in some path between them, right? I take some path, then that path length is going to be my distance. But the displacement is going to be that arrow and the magnitude of displacement is going to be the length between those two points. So now I have two comparable quantities. What can I, oh, what can I infer from this? Something between distance and the magnitude of displacement. Whoa. So this means that if I take two points, the magnitude of the displacement between them is going to be the shortest possible path length. In other words, the shortest possible distance. A connection. So nowhere till now did I have to bring in the idea that the body is moving only in one line, which is one dimensional motion. Which means that every single inference I made will be applicable to any general kind of motion. But what if the motion is restricted to just one dimension? What would that mean? Can I make some other better inferences in that kind of motion? So let me first try and visualize what such a world would be like? What would it be like to live in a world that's one dimensional? It'll kind of be like I'm living in an elevator, right? Because I can, I can go up or I can go down or I can stay where I am and nothing else. So in this kind of a world, the idea of the angle for displacement is kind of lost because there are only two possible directions, either up or down. Can I use this? Can I use this very cleverly to somehow make my job easier? What if, what if I mark my ground floor as zero? And then each floor up, I call them positive numbers, one, two, three, and so on. And each floor down, let's say basement one and basement two as minus one, minus two, minus three, and so on. So in one sense, I'm defining up as positive and down as negative. Then I can very cleverly define my displacement as the final position minus the initial position. And what exactly might this achieve? This makes it so that if you just calculate this number, final position minus initial position, both of these are numbers, and you'll get a number such that the magnitude, the actual value itself of the number will give you the magnitude of displacement. And the sign of that number will give you the direction in which displacement happened. So if you get plus in your answer, it means you went up. And if you get a minus, it means you went down. So what just happened here is not trivial. You've shown that as long as the motion is one dimensional, right? You're moving along some given straight line then we don't need the all-powerful vector to represent displacement. I can just use a number as long as I'm careful about my signs. Then what I'm effectively doing is taking my direction and magnitude, two things, and encoding that into a number. So what, what else can I infer? Wait, as long as the body is moving in one direction alone, right? If it's 1D motion, it's not changing, it's not retracing its path back. These two quantities that I have, distance 
and displacement become very closely connected the distance will always be equal to the magnitude of the displacement oh this is great so i've played a lot with these two words distance and displacement and i've understood but but can i ask myself something else that will help me really test my understanding of motion itself wait when i began i decided whether a body is moving or not moving based on the fact that i had to turn my head to keep following it let i want to do a small thought experiment if i imagine watching a bus and looking at it as it's moving then i have to turn my head to keep track with it keep, keep you know be on track so i say that it's in motion but what if there's a person inside the bus right and he is looking at the bus he doesn't really have to turn his head at all and he says no no the bus is not moving clearly both of us are disagreeing so one of us has to be right and the other wrong right so we disagree but what if i appoint the earth as a judge and you know with respect to the earth i am at rest so then i can say hey the earth says you are moving so you must be moving i win then but but what if he says i am appointing a bigger judge the sun if you go and look at look at this from the sun you and the earth are going backwards and me in the bus we standing right there so with respect to the sun i am at rest you are the one who's moving then i can't refute the sun what do i do i'm really confused how do i decide absolutely whether somebody is moving or not how can i answer that question how do i disprove somebody to prove that they are moving wow this means that i cannot define displacement i cannot say somebody is moving or not moving without also defining from whose point of view i'm talking so if somebody disagrees with me I have absolutely no way to disprove the other person because he can just say hey I'm the one at rest you're moving in the opposite direction so if we do disagree then both of us are right in our own way oh this means that motion itself does not have an absolute definition its definition is relative i want to go deeper into this idea what if what if i also bring time into the picture <laughs>